I've seen the paintings in this building. Can't you just borrow some of the paintings from around? I could do, but you know, we have too many paintings of brown old men. And it's a bit depressing if you're surrounded by them all the time. So I see them as I go through the corridors. But in here, I'd like to have greater colour. I've got a woman scientist over there um, who was the um, uh, wife and also the, um, uh, uh, the uh, lab assistant for Lavoisier. I just think it's more cheerful. Obviously, we forgive them a lot because of time, but obviously some of these early volumes have articles about things that wouldn't wouldn't be classified as science these days, or they're going down avenues that would be frowned upon these days. Is any of this stuff ever a, a source of embarrassment, or do you sort of cringe a little bit when you look at this early science, or is it so long ago you just sort of sit back and... No, I just admire them for trying to do what they could do with what they had available. I mean, some of the um, experiments that are described are basically vivisection. And um, I was reading actually recently that Robert Hooke, who was very important at the birth of society, really didn't like um, the experiments he was doing. He did not like to see animals suffer. And he, he was very squeamish about that. Not, not all of those who wrote here were. Um, but it's interesting to see that sort of um, a, a, a human part coming out in these, um, these accounts as well. The Royal Society, I know these days, is trying to be very forward-looking and progressive and making a real difference now. And yet there is this sort of, I don't know if it's a conflict, but there's this other side to things where you've got this incredible 350-year-old history that you're really celebrating this year and, and taking great pride in. Where do, you, where do you stand on this? I mean, how much is the past the past and we need to sort of look, look forward? And how much do we sort of just sit back and bask in past glories and golden eras? Well, you know, that connected. The truth is the Royal Society has been committed to the pursuit of it may sound a bit pompous, the pursuit of scientific truth. It's what drives it. And if we are listened to in giving scientific advice, policy advice, it's because it's built on 350 years of history, of a dedication to uh, understanding the world and to use critical, rational judgments based on reliable data. And these two things are connected, the policy with the science, because there's so many mavericks out there who are giving advice about different areas that are relevant to science who simply are not of the same quality of the scientists involved in the Royal Society. And we give credibility to the Royal Society scientists based on this 350-year history. And, you know, one of the things that you, 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 you see about the, the, the society, it's not run by managers, it's run by highly distinguished and effective scientists. When you go around the world, academies and societies like this often run by I individuals who are very good, very uh, accomplished at what they do, but there isn't quite the same focus on real scientific achievement. And this rather separates out the, the Royal Society as being different and perhaps more effective in this arena than many other uh, academies around the world. So the the old funny calves, heads and things like that, you see more as something that's giving a bit of credibility rather than being an anchor and looking a bit old fashioned. Well, of course it's old fashioned, but I mean, what I did 40 years ago when I was a beginning scientist is also old fashioned. Today, what you see through this is the natural curiosity, the focus on accurate observation and detail and trying to make conclusions from it. That's what I do, it's what they did. They didn't have the same knowledge base. Of course we can't judge them by today's standard, but they were doing good work. Paul, one of the things that just generally excites me about looking at publications at the Royal Society is so often we can then go back and find these original letters and manuscripts with crossing out and mm. diagrams and handwritten things. And it's, it feels like in sort of a hundred years when I look at, for example, your publications in journals, I'm not going to have that anymore. It feels like that's something that's been lost to science. Well, I worry a bit about that. I mean, it's true that I'm ancient and a bit of a dinosaur, I have to admit. I still write manuscripts by hand. I don't know anybody else that does, I have to say. I'm, of course, there are a few of us left. So I still have uh, manuscripts that look a little bit like this, because I hate typing and I only write well when I'm doing it by hand. So I'm probably the very, very last of the paper generation. But let me say something. We are looking here at something we can read written in 1664. And with our modern digital computer generated manuscripts, probably in 30 years, we will be unable to read 
what we've got because it, we will have changed programs, changed hardware and so on. And yet this is still open to us 350 years later. This, beautifully printed, we can still read. I worry that the stuff we're producing now, unless we take care of this in particular ways, um, are, uh, 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 the future scientists just won't be able to have the easy access to it. I mean, you say that, and we say it with a smile, but how worried are you? I, I'm really worried about that. No, I say it with a smile because I sort of think we're not stupid as a, as a, you know, as a community and we will end up solving it. But what, I've, what I have noticed that, um, is that access to uh, scientific um, papers changes because we used to have everything uh, bound in books like this. So you go back to 1970, 1960 or whatever, I mean 1950s even, when I was starting my research work. Now, unless you can search for it on the computer, so you can go, you, you, you don't find it. And so everything sort of stops at about 1990. And what's, I say, entertaining for me, I mean, what's interesting for me is, of course, my most significant work was over by 1990. So I'm dispatched to the dustbin of history, and nobody can even read what I wrote back there, or at least not readily. But I think scientists are sensible. We will maintain and keep that. And I find, think that's really important because often you get good ideas from this older work. And I always give my students, when they come to work with me, I give them a very early 20th century book, 100 years old now, in cell and developmental biology, because it's full of ideas, many of which we haven't sold to today. Whereas if you just give them recent work, they just focus on what everybody else is working on. So there's a lot to be said for going back to the original paper stuff, and I completely have sympathy with you. I just think, I'm not pessimistic, I just think we probably will sort it. In the long run, for a piece of science, for a theory or an observation to really um, persist, you need reproduction of it by somebody else. You need to have debate about it. And through that debate, the original idea will either be modified or changed or will be maintained. It could even be rejected if it, indeed it's completely artifactual. So what we see here is the process of science. And through the publication and through these correspondence, that becomes a very effective process. We have these sort of famous top tier journals and then we have sort of specialist journals that particular scientists want their work published in. Where does, what's Phil Trans's unique selling point or whatever we call it? Well, it's, it's, it's a, a jur journal and it's sort of divided into both physical sciences and the biological sciences. It's high quality. It, it doesn't have um, the same profile as say the journals like Nature or Science. Though even those are partly specialised. I mean, there's only certain areas that will go in there, and there's other very important areas that really uh, don't go near those journals. Um, certain areas are, uh, of science are very well represented in, um, in, in Filtrans and are very highly respected. Other areas it doesn't deal with um, very much. So it, it's like um, a ordinary but high-class scientific journal. And you know, these journals go up and down actually. Journals that were important when I was a boy, um, many of them are no longer important and journals just uh, play around going up and down in the, um, during the years. Talking to a scientist as famous as you and the president of the Royal Society and talking about journals, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't ask you what you think about the state of journals at the moment. It's, it is not an uncontroversial subject. We hear about things like open access and paywalls yeah. and publication. Do you have a sort of a general position on the current state of journals in general and where you'd like things to be? Well, um, it'd be too strong to say I have a position. What I certainly can tell you is that we are in a period of really very significant change. Um, digital means of production and communication change the way that we think about things. Um, it's changing how much can be published because um, previously, if everything had to be within paper, there was a limit on how much you could actually publish. And that meant that uh, quite often important observations that perhaps weren't consistent with modern ideas or perhaps um, didn't come to very interesting conclusions might never get really uh, properly published, whereas now we can. But we need to handle a lot of data. So there's a number of issues that I think we need to think about. Um, 
Uh, how can we uh, ensure that we're publishing everything, but we can find everything we want? Because if you just use keywords and so on, which is often found, you just find the sorts of things that you were thinking of before. I, for example, with at least some of the journals, just read, just browse through it and try and make connections that I wouldn't do. If you're just constantly dominated by the digital paradigm, then you obviously lose that. You mentioned open access. Now, open access, which some uh, individuals are very zealous about, and indeed the British government here um, wants to promote gold access, it's a little complicated because the cost of publishing then falls on the person who's doing the work. Now, if you come from a poor lab or a poor country, that is difficult to actually deliver. The, uh, even for me, who's in a well-funded lab, it is a significant cost to buy open access. And others out there, I know, really struggle with this. So you've got to think about this. You don't want to turn off certain researchers. So what we're doing here at the Society is having a series of seminars, um, four or five of them in the next coming months, to discuss these issues by people who are more expert than me, who have thought more about them, to see how we can think about the future of publishing in exactly the way that you've said. Are there different things we have to do? Should we think more out of the box rather than sort of um, always going in the same direction as to think about how we can ensure that the scientific endeavour continues to thrive, based as it is on publication, based on the prototype of Phil Trans, but modifying how we work given the fact we have many, many more scientists and different ways of communicating. So this is Sir Paul's office. Let's go in and meet him. Hello, Brady. Hello. Now, this is Sir Paul but you have told me I am to call you Paul. You're dead right. I'm not being disrespectful. This is instructions from the man himself.